Welcome to this introduction on historical network analysis. Uh, the goal today is not to uh, enter too deeply into uh, graph theory and, and all the metrics that goes with that and, 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 and to go uh, into the technical aspects of the application of graph theory and network analysis to historical documents, but more to uh, give some kind of overview on what can be done with uh, uh, network analysis regarding to historical sources and archives and documents and, and photographies and so. I will start with a, a short introduction about the main interest in my view um, of network analysis for history, which is contextualization or hyper-contextualization. Uh, network analysis is a way to uh, broaden our view on a specific subject and, and to, to, to help us dig into archives we have not necessarily identified as an important archive between, I don't know, a specific set of any individuals and, and network will give the context around a specific situation. And um, so, so let, let's take a, a, a very simple example. Let's, let's say we will study two people writing to each other. The graphical convention uh, to display or to represent this kind of, of relation uh, would be, would be uh, uh, of, of this kind, uh, which means two vertices connected by an edge. You, you, you've probably seen this kind of representation, dots, nodes, and, 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 and links between them, and that's, uh, that's something that is completely around us uh, in our uh, representations, because we see that for metro maps, we see that uh, on, on posters everywhere, uh, uh, and, and this is also why this kind of representation re relates a lot about how we as historians consider our own subjects, because we always think our subject as relations between peoples and, and complex situation where things appear in a specific context and so. So let's start with these couple of vertices and so elaborate that we are interested in the relation between these two people. So this relation can be, I don't know, 10 letters between these, these two people at a certain point. Um, of course, traditional historian will look at the content of the, these 10 letters and will try to extract content and, and meaningful information from that. Uh, this is of course something we have to do and, 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 and network analysis will, will not get rid of this kind of approach. But what will be interesting here is to look at, in example here, um, the, the archives uh, of these two persons and see that they also have other uh, um, uh, relationships with other individuals. The, these central relations appears in, in, in this context. And, and, and moreover, uh, we will realize very soon that some individuals can be the bridges between our two main uh, persons of interest here. Uh, they could be linked to both of them, which will mean something structural, very interesting uh, in the end, probably. Um, of course, these neighbors, these, these neighbors of the two, the two persons that are interesting to, 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 to us historian, could also have relations together. They can be linked together as well. And knowing that um, people that have also written or received letters from our two individuals uh, also exchanges letters uh, between them is something that will probably be also very meaningful to contextualize the relation of our two individuals here. Uh, these neighbors can have also neighbors themselves, people that are not connected to the to the two people we are uh, focused on uh, in, 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 in blue here, and they could they can also have second degree neighbors, and, and, and you can expand the graph as you as, as you want at least well as as the probably the um, the document uh, availability is, is still um, is still here uh, at least if we, we have the, this document. This very simple example to show you that the interpretation you can make uh, about the relation between these two persons is in a specific context and, and, and this context should influence the way you are interpreting this relation and not only the content of these, let's say, 10 letters. And the meaning of this 10 letters relation will probably be very, very different if it occurs within a specific group a well, well uh, constructed group or if it is the bridge between two different groups or if it occurs within a group that is disconnected from others, etc., etc. This is, this is exactly this, this, this concept of, of contextualization the structural uh, analysis gives to the historian. Um, is my relation, are these 10 letters connecting these persons in this context or in this one? And, and you, you, can, you can imagine making 
hyper contextualization with very very large archives and 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 still be interested in in these two person in the end and you will wrote, write your your article on these two people but you will have this global overview of all the relations and be able to qualify the relation between these two persons uh, not only with the content of the letter but also who it is uh, uh, connected to the rest of the graph um, let's get to um, a few basics of graph theory uh, and especially because uh, it's probably what will interest history in the most is the history of the development of this uh, discipline uh, in itself and will take as a, as a first step in, in this uh, history uh, the uh, Seven Bridges of Königsberg problem by Leonard Euler, uh, who developed at the 18th century uh, a mathematical demonstration that lays the, the basis of, of uh, graph theory. Uh, imagine the city of Königsberg, which is uh, Kaliningrad today, uh, a city uh, built on, on a river and, and with this specific uh, island in the, in the center and divided in different areas. Um, uh, the question uh, people are uh, supposed to have in, 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 in Königsberg is is it possible to find a path that goes through all the bridges without uh, uh, coming twice uh, through the same bridge? And, and, and is it possible to, to visit all the, the areas of the city um, on, on the Sunday walk? Uh, so uh, uh, what is interesting is that the problem uh, is reformulated in abstract terms by, by Euler in, in his paper. Uh, each area of the city is a vertex and each bridge is an edge connecting them. Other geographical characteristics are not relevant to test the different path. In fact, you, you can simply simplify uh, uh, the, the, the problem as a, as a mathematical object. And, and Euler observed that, except at the endpoints of the, the walk, of course, uh, whenever one enters a vertex by a bridge, one leaves the vertex by a bridge. So that means that um, uh, the number of bridges touching every area must be even if you want to be able to, to, to go through this area. Uh, uh, so here, uh, all the vertices have an odd number of bridges connecting them. Um, so, so, of course, uh, two, two areas can have an, an odd number of bridges if they are the starting and ending point of the walk, but not all of them. So here there's no path. There is no possible path in, in this, this uh, situation. Um, so uh, this demonstration is, is very interesting because it consists in counting connections. You see, I've, I've written the number of connections here, 5, 3, 3, 3, um, uh, uh, which is exactly the foundation of graph theory, which, which consists precisely in, in, in producing this kind of metrics. Um, let's take another example just to, just to have an idea of the applications and the first applications of this kind of theories uh, to real life situations. We, uh, here we have this uh, uh, Moreno uh, uh, sociogram from 1934. Uh, so Jacob Moreno and his assistant uh, uh, mapped the relation within classrooms of, of, of young children. Uh, imagine this early semester exercise uh, where we ask all the children to name the two people they want to be seated next to and then map these relations uh, on, on a piece of paper and, and and, and try to understand, do the, do the girls want to be seated next to girls, boys next to boys, and so on. And what is extremely interesting in, in Moreno's sociograms is the fact that he's already creating new metrics to analyze the situation of these boys and girls uh, in, in these classrooms. He tries to understand where people want to be seated next to each other. He, wants to, he, he tries to understand who are the people that are the stars of this network, the people, uh, the, the, the very famous or popular boys and girls of, the, of this classrooms um, and also the, the uh, isolated individuals, the people that, that will probably not find uh, uh, the, 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 any match in, in the classroom. And what is interesting with Moreno graphs is uh, that he designed them by hand and he tried to show the different relationships between boys and girls and how these relationships evolve with age. So he shows for a very lower classes that uh, uh, boys are okay to, to sit next to girls and 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 and, and after uh, uh, that this the difference between, between boys and girls became uh, uh, much more Im important and divided the graph and he presented his sociogram uh, as the one on the left here where he put the boys as triangle on the side and the girls as circles on the other side and then he 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 present the the, the relation within them and this Representations show very well that there are two relations, only two relations between boys and girls in this classroom here. 
these are the two edges that connects the two sides of, of this sociogram. And what is extremely interesting is that if you take exactly the same data set and, and you, you, you map, it, map it with a forest directed uh, algorithm, which is the, an, an, a, a class of algorithm that is mostly used today for, for a graph visualization, um, you will see that the clusters that are formed are not the same uh, Moreno uh, thought the cluster where, uh, or the, 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 the cluster found by Moreno in, in 34. Um, uh, especially, you will see that the groups of the girls is separ separated here in two uh, clusters and not an, only one, which means this little blue uh, uh, group in the center here is not more connected to the other girls than to the boys group. And that is an insight we have only with the visualization here. It's not something that can be extracted from, from, from the data, except that you will probably find a community here, but you will not be able to say if this community is more connected to the left group or to the right group. So that means that the way we visualize networks will all, all, also uh, uh, um, condition our interpretation and, 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 will, and will show us things that were not shown if, if we were visualizing it another way. Which is why, of course, graph theory is a lot about metrics and calculation, but also uh, 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 visualization. Um, if you take this, this example of all the possible readings you can make of a network, um, you have, of course, this visual, visual analysis, looking at the overall distribution, organization of the nodes, uh, uh, seeing if you see clusters, sparse, sparse area, uh, cliques, and, 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 and co components that are very strong, strongly connected. So that's the visual reading of a graph. But of course, you will also have local metrics, metrics that calculate information about a specific node in the graph. And you will probably cal need to calculate them for all the nodes of the graph to be able to, <laughs> to extract this, this value for, for each node which could be the number of neighbors. We've seen the, the neighbors concept before, which is the, the, the degree centrality. Uh, we'll have the, the betweenness centrality, which measures uh, how much a node is, at the, 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 is on the path between the other nodes and so and so. So many different local metrics that will help you highlight specific elements uh, of, your, of your network uh, uh, to, to, to dig a bit more on, 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 on this kind of individuals, if, if these are individuals like a letter network or so. And you also have these global metrics, the, the, the global density of the graph, the global clustering coefficient that will help you compare graph uh, 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 or compare different graph or com compare the same graph evolving on time or over time or, or so. So I will not uh, take any longer on this kind of metrics because here the purpose of this presentation is to discuss how historians use uh, network uh, analysis and visualization and not to dig too much into these uh, specific details. But of course, the question of how do we translate what these metrics are giving us uh, on, a, on a very large spreadsheet, uh, how do we translate that to historical uh, interpretation is something that is subject to debate, of course. How do, we, how do we do that? Now, let's spend some more time on how do historians use their archives to produce network, and especially um, are there different ways of using this kind of, of archival data to produce perhaps different, different types of networks. I propose a typology that distinguished three different types of networks. That's not something that has to be forever. That's more a tool that I offer to try to understand what we are doing when we are analyzing historical networks. The first type is the reconstituted network, which is a network where you will try to summarize a situation. You, 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 you grab data on different archival document, uh, you, will take, you will take things from here, from here, and you will try to make an overview of your subject. That is more or less like drawing something in your, in your uh, uh, notebook based on all the archives you've gathered. And, and you will try to make a nice picture about that and, and, and a picture that summarizes and helps you understand your subject better and helps your reader, of course, understand your subject better. A very nice example about this kind of uh, process is this, is this paper about the, the, the main uh, families in, 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 in Firenze at the 15th century, where the authors uh, tried to recompose the network of these families. But of course, they know probably much, much more about the Medici's than some other uh, uh, less, less known families. 
Uh, anyway, they will try to map all possible relations between them and they have dozens of, of, of relations, uh, different types of relations. Are the family married together or do they have economical relations? Do they have a, a, a political relation? Are they, are they friends and, 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 and sharing, sharing goods, sharing money, sharing uh, places and so and so. So uh, a network where you put everything you find uh, about a specific subject to, to try to summarize the subject. But of course, you know that this will never be completely uh, 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 sound because uh, they, they will probably be missing data somewhere. You will probably have more on this kind of this part of the subject than this one, and so, which is not really a problem in, in itself because the, the only goal here is to uh, summarize and, and reconstitute uh, everything you have and possibly everything you can have. So, anyway, sometimes you are forced to do that. Um, the second type is the extracted, or what I call the extracted network, um, which is a network where uh, you have uh, a source that is listing elements. Especially here, you can have uh, all the authors of specific journals, and you will list all the authors that published together or that have been published in the same issues and, and or at the same time uh, in a specific journal or in, in a few journals. Or you can have an affiliation graph of charities in the in the in the U.S. here, uh, where everybody is connected to a specific organization or more than one organization at once, and 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 then you will project this graph to try to to have this person-to-person -person relations uh, to see if people were sitting in the same committee at the same time. So basically, these networks consist in extracting information from a source that is. Uh, uh, in general, uh, a list or something that looks like a list, or, or you, you will make a list from, from your archival documents and then you will map them as a network. And this is probably the, uh, the type that is the most used in the historical uh, sciences because it, it's very convenient and it relates a lot with uh, uh, how our archives are organized in general. And then the third uh, type of analysis uh, um, is the metadata network, where you will not be interested in the content anymore, uh, but you will be interested in the circulation of these documents. So you will map letters written from a place to another. Um, you will you will look at these circulations and, and all these big projects about the Republic of Letters. These, these three years are really uh, projects that made this kind of metadata network analysis popular uh, within the historical uh, sciences. There is another way of using networks, of course, which is not related to uh, the kind of source we use to produce uh, specific networks, but it's related to the way we will be using this output for the research, uh, which, which means that you will, you will have all three types of networks in this, in this one, which is the network as interface, which, me which means now the network is not anymore a way to produce metrics to analyze a specific situation or to produce a visualization to, com to, to understand the globality and the structure of uh, 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 the situation, but the network will be the interface, the way uh, you will use to look at the data and, and, to, and to dig into the data, to come back to the data. And, and of course, it's very power powerful to have uh, this kind of graph representation of your database, which is basically, if, if you have a network database, a, a graph-based a graph database, um, and, and the network will help you go back to the data and click on, 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 on vertices and, and, and click on edges and, and understand better um, uh, what your data is about and, and to come back to the archives. Now I propose a specific case study, which is not only a way to illustrate what has been said before, but that is also a way to go a bit further into data modeling for historical networks, and especially when you are dealing with very complex situations that are expressed at different levels, that needs a temporal dimension and, and so so this this short example um, is, is, a, is a way to address these questions. We will speak here about the International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation, which is a, a, a specific committee of the League of Nations uh, between the, the 1920s and 30s. So League of Nations, uh, which is the, the ancestor of the current United Nations, uh, built this committee uh, and gathered uh, scientists from, from all over the world uh, to try to uh, uh, make people talk together uh, again after the First World War. Uh, and especially to show to the scientific and academic world that uh, cooperation was possible and, 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 and to try to, to, try to uh, uh, increase the, the amount of collaboration uh, within uh, all scientific fields. So you see on this picture uh, very uh, famous people like 
you'll probably have recognized Albert Einstein uh, uh, at the end of the table or, or Hendrik Lorentz. Many scientists that are at the eighth of their career and they are giving time for uh, uh, intellectual cooperation. And what will be interesting here is not necessarily what these people are uh, preparing together around this table, but how they uh, shape or reshape scientific exchanges and how they get information from uh, all over the world and, 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 and spread information and, and try to coordinate uh, efforts. And these documents can be official documents, official minutes of, of the meetings, they can be letters, telegrams, they can be internal notes and so on and so on. And all these documents are telling us something about the relation between these persons. Not necessarily only the persons around the table, of course, but persons around uh, the world. And here, like, of course, a note can be written from, from a secretary to another, uh, a letter can be written by the president to all the members, or uh, a telegram can be written by, by someone outside the League of Nations to this committee to have an information and so on. So, so all these documents are uh, tokens of collaboration or tokens of relations. And um, these documents can be represented as, as, a, as, a, as a network, as a big graph in this example here, we work only on a, a, a few years uh, to keep that uh, uh, analyzable. And here, this network, this complex network, is exactly what we uh, call an hairball, which is a network where it is impossible to see the structure globally just by looking at it. Um, you will need to uh, find ways to uh, try to uh, um, to play with the visualization and to play with the metrics to extract information from this kind of object. So you have here uh, more than 3,000 people connected together around the Committee uh, on Intellectual Cooperation, this committee which, which are the dark blue nodes in this, in this uh, representation. What can we do to, to try to uh, uh, read this network and understand the evolution of the structure? Of course, we can divide the network into time slices like years here and, and try to, to, to give to, to make sense from uh, uh, this representation to understand the evolution of the relations. So that works very well to understand the, the evolution of the quantity, but to analyze the evolution of the structure will need probably to go even further than that because even a specific year here is a bit complicated to be, to be read uh, by the eye. And of course we'll work with metrics, we'll work uh, here with uh, some global metrics, density, the evolution of density, the evolution of clustering, but also local metrics to see the evolution of the, 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 the position of a certain number of people in the structure here to analyze if they are more or less connected uh, at, at, a certain mo at a certain moment or, or uh, at another. Um, of course, another way to analyze kind of big graphs is, is to focus on a on, on specific ego network or specific net individuals uh, within the networks. And here we can select two persons and 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 and, and uh, color their their uh, neighbors in, in blue for one, in yellow for the other, and in green for the, uh, the the people that are connected to both of these these persons. And this approach will help us to understand. Uh, the specific networking uh, practices of, of certain individuals because here if these individuals are coming out from outside the League of Nations uh, what will be extremely interesting here is to see that they are trying to to get into this 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 big network and 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 and, and they will write the letters at specific people to try to get involved and to get financed by the institution especially here and and we see that these two persons that are working closely together they, they are uh, connected to very different parts of the graph and and, we, and that tells us a lot about their own social behavior within this field. Um, what we can do as well is to try to find other data sets to complement the one we have so we can work with them together to produce a multi-layer um, system because what we do have here is, uh, is, is, is quite a flat uh, representation of the relations between individuals and, and all the letters and, and the documents uh, where uh, uh, they are mentioned or that are uh, uh, connecting them together. And, and this, is, this, is, this is just, a, just, just one layer of every relations we can imagine about uh, intellectual cooperation within the League of Nations. And so to this metadata network, we'll add another one, which is 
uh, an, uh, an extracted network, another type of network, the, the network of all the individuals within this organization and how they are affiliated to different bodies or entities of this uh, big, very, very large uh, bureaucratic uh, organization. So it will make the link between the individuals and the committees or, or uh, secretaries or boards and so and so. Um, and, and of course, at a certain point in time, people are affiliated to, to many different uh, uh, organizational uh, structures at the, at the upper level. And if we want, if we want to play a bit more with uh, uh, new data sets to, to try to, to understand this, this hierarchy or this verticality in, in the network, we can add this uh, uh, network of all the entities uh, of the League of Nations and their relation together, uh, especially their, their hierarchy within the League of Nations. And we will work with what is here an organization chart of the League of Nations, which is, as you see, quite a big uh, uh, organization. Uh, and, and, and this information will give us uh, um, uh, insight about how these committees are connected together and how they are connected to top level organizations, which could be uh, the main secretariat of the, of the League of Nations or, or which could be other uh, uh, organizations that are connected to the League of Nations. So that means that here we are developing a model that is developing itself at different level. And this level are different graph layers, uh, which means that we can connect these layers together and get some kind of multi-layer uh, network uh, analysis and visualization. So this is what could be done with this kind of data. A 3D uh, representation of these different networks connected together where you have uh, top organizations, uh, organization entity, uh, uh, and individuals. So individuals at the bottoms are linked together because they are sharing documents uh, uh, and writing letters. Uh, organizations are connected together because they, they, they share officially relations. They are supposed to be connected to each other uh, within, within uh, the, the, the hierarchy of the, the organization. And, and they are connected to a top level organization, the, the League of Nations, the states, uh, uh, the different uh, uh, large uh, um, entities that are uh, working on, on, on multilateralism and, and intellect, intellectual cooperation. And of course, you have these uh, vertical links that could be affiliation links, which would be the case here between the organizations and the top organizations, so that means they are affiliated to, uh, but the individuals, they can be affiliated to very uh, uh, a different part of the, the upper level uh, network, of course. So this is a three-dimensional three representation, but of course, in many cases, we want to simplify that to be able to analyze it better because, of course, 3D is not necessarily uh, easy to read. So that means we'll have to use a few visual and uh, uh, statistical tricks to try to flatten the uh, uh, hierarchy and the affiliations at, at uh, uh, the lower level here. Um, uh, and here we have one possible uh, uh, modeling for, for these kind of situations where you will keep as a basis uh, the uh, metadata network, the, 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 all the letters exchanged between these 3,000 people, but you will group them according to the upper, upper layer. And, and, and you will group all the people from the International Committee on Intel intellectual cooperation somewhere and, and its secretariat here and its subcommittees here and, and all the people from this part and this part and this part of the organization there will be maps uh, on a, a two-dimensional uh, representation here which I call uh, an organizational uh, uh, topography and and one possible uh, process here would be to, to come back to the to the metrics of graph theory and to apply them to this graph and to see if they correlate with the organization of the graph now um, because now the organization or the special organization means something because it's this kind of uh, institutional topography uh, and we'll see very well that the between S centrality here uh, uh, is very related to uh, uh, people, uh, member of a specific uh, group of, this, of the network and so on. So. And of course we'll play uh, and we'll continue to play with our model and, 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 and to divide uh, this time uh, the, the, the graph according to the temporality and to see uh, these relations evolve within this topography, or within this grouping, uh, and to see that at a certain point in time, this subcommittee is very important, and at this, and, and, and two, two years later, it, it is this institute that is important, and so. Uh, uh, so, so, so being able to, 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 
to multiply, uh, to, to find a new axis of analysis uh, with our model. And we can, of, co of course, expand our model on uh, another axis, another direction, which could be different facets uh, uh, related to different type of relations, like uh, relations uh, that are documents speaking about university relations or documents uh, uh, concerning uh, exchange of, of material or, or exchange of students or exchange of professors and so on and so on. And we'll be able to uh, uh, cut the graph into very, very little pieces where things will be more uh, readable. And of course, where once again, we'll be able to run all these metrics to see that specifically on a specific time, this committee was more important than this institute if we only take the document concerning university relations, for example, and, and then to be able to come back to uh, uh, um, the specific archival documents that are uh, creating this relation and, and know to be able to, as an historian, say that um, this set of documents here are precisely what makes the relations between Geneva and Paris uh, uh, at this certain moment uh, around this certain group of people and so on. So, uh, to conclude now, let's remember that when we produce a network from our archives, we are not doing the Facebook of the past. We are mapping our archives. The content of the archives, the information we can extract for, from, from these archives, the circulation of these archives, that's not the subject in itself. That's, that's only an artifact that will be useful for us to get back to the archives. Network analysis is a tool. It's, it's one tool among all the other tools you have in your history and toolbox. Like every other tool, it has to be criticized, discussed, uh, and of course, uh, being able to express your subject as a network does not mean that you will find the data to analyze it as a network. 